This video has been sponsored by Dream Garage Auctions, a new platform founded by two software engineers and automotive enthusiasts. They're creating a site specializing in selling usable examples of classic, performance and luxury vehicles, with owners and vehicles being hand-picked and curated by the team to make the experience as transparent as possible. There are already cars on the site, so go and check it out, and if you've got a car you'd like to sell which fits the bill, the process is free to sellers and easy for buyers. To find out more, check the link in the description below. Hello everybody. As I have got older and matured just a little bit, I have realized the importance of being able to admit when I have made a mistake. And today, I have made a mistake. You see, not too long ago, I got a lovely email from a gentleman called Tim, inviting me to come and drive his Aston Martin D. S. Now I've driven the DBS previously, but it wasn't on perfect roads. It's a car that I've lusted after, as I'm sure many of you have, ever since I saw it make something of a mess of itself in Casino Royale. As you probably noticed, this is not the old Aston Martin DBS. This is the new Aston Martin DBS. I realised my mistake as soon as Tim lifted the door on his lovely looking garage and my heart sank but then it jumped up just a little bit because I thought ah I've got an opportunity here you see I to date have not driven any of the new Aston Martin lineup I haven't tried the new Vantage haven't tried the DB11 and I haven't until half an hour ago tried one of these either I've had my own ideas about these new cars but I do like to be the sort of person that can back up their opinion with a little bit of experience. And so I'm very, very grateful to Tim for letting me take this out. It also means that I can bring you this car truly unbiased because I've done no preparation for this review whatsoever. All the research I did was for the old car. What I can tell you about this one is it has a lot of power, though very, very expensive, and nobody really bought one. The DB11 was already a little bit pricey and nobody, literally nobody said, you know what we really need? We need one of those with loads more power that's even more expensive. I have to say though, the DBS did something for me because the other two new Aston Martins, the 11 and the Vantage, when they came out, I looked at them, I just thought, no, that's not really for me. This thing though, Ooh, it gives me the fizz, big time. Now, speaking of big time, this is also a very large car, but... Ooh, it can move, it can really, really move. Now, as it happens this weekend, I am also driving around a large, twin-turbocharged, 12-cylinder Grand Tourer, the Bentley Continental. So I've accidentally happened upon something of a comparison. I'll be talking about the Bentley in another video and you'll probably have seen that one already. But the other car that this has really reminded me of is the Ferrari F12. Because how many rear-wheel drive, 700 horsepower GT cars are there out there? Over the Ferrari, the Aston has a couple of obvious differences. It is, unbelievably, still a little bit cheaper than, say, the 812, which really is the fairest thing to compare it with, but still a pricey car. It's also got two small back seats and two turbochargers up the front, helping that 5.2-litre V12 along as if it needed it. The result is a car with obscene performance. Much like the Ferrari, this really seems to have some trouble getting the power to the ground, even on what you would describe as the perfect day. Now, it's presented here in a very, very subtle shade of black, which is the owner's colour of choice and matches the rest of his collection. He is also a man with a very varied collection. He's not an Aston diehard, but when this came out, he decided that he had to have one. Fortunately, he didn't buy this car brand new. It already had about 900 miles on the clock, to which he's added another 3,000 and saved himself quite a bit of cash in the process. The last time I saw a new DBS for sale, it was at Aston Martin Works. It was one of the On Her Majesty's Secret Service editions. And for the privilege of owning one of those bits of dubious Bond tat, you're gonna pay more than 300,000 pounds. Crikey, oh blimey, Aston. 
I must confess, it is from in here that I have the biggest problem with the DBS. There is a lot that I'm really liking, even on these Surrey roads. And I've got to say, Surrey is pretty much my least favourite place on earth to test a car, especially one quite as capable as this. But my big problem is that Mercedes-derived interior. You see, these are seriously pricey cars, and this interior is certainly nice. It's definitely a step up above from say an AMG GT, but it doesn't feel much newer than the old Astons, the outgoing cars. It feels of the same vintage. I don't really feel like Aston have moved the game on. That Bentley I'm driving around in, well, the old one was very much feeling its age, and the new one is just miles ahead. It genuinely feels like a 10-year newer car. Of course, you can forget all of that when you press the loud pedal, and oh, from 2,500 RPM, it just shifts. Makes a pretty good sound too. I've just, I've not been able to get over 4,000 RPM. I just haven't. But this interior is just a bit hodgepodge. It feels like a mock-up. The screen here should really be able to be made to go away. These buttons are all a bit too familiar. And the one thing that really annoys me, and I know it sounds very petty, Two seconds. One thing that's very petty, door handles. With this generation of cars, Aston Martin pretty much threw out everything that they had previously. Engine, chassis tech, interior, the lot. But they kept the door handles. If you're a serial Aston Martin buyer, you already had a DB9 or a Vanquish or, or a Vantage or, or, or something like that, do you really want the first thing of your brand new quarter million pound or 300,000 pound Aston that you touch to be precisely the same as your 15 year old one? I wouldn't. Now this car has a reversing camera and a 360 degree bird's eye view thing. That's very nice, probably not standard. The steering wheel is off an Austin Allegro. Well, it's square. They call it 177 and actually I quite like it. The paddles are pretty big. They're not any nice material or anything, and they don't move, but they're fine. They're connected to an eight-speed gearbox at the back, and I apologize if this review is coming to you in a slightly unordered fashion, but a car like this on roads I don't know, I'm just gonna give you the information as it comes to me. A lot of people criticise Aston Martin for fitting an 8-speed auto gearbox to these cars. Now my buddy James in particular thinks one of the reasons they failed is that they didn't fit a dual clutch. Personally, I've no problem with the 8-speed. I think it was the right choice for Aston Martin to make. It's calibrated well enough. In GT mode, you've got GT Sport, Sport Plus for suspension and powertrain. The GT mode is a little bit too slow, but it shifts really well in Sport. Sport Plus just I'm not going to bother with. Now, there's still some turbo lag in this car. There is, but it's much more predictable than in the Bentleys. And as a sports car, this thing is way better. Way better than the Bentley. It really is. As a practical item, it's far, far inferior. Nearly no room in the boot. This one does have the obligatory set of golf clubs, proof that at least one Aston Martin owner does really play golf. And that's all you're going to get in the back. The back seats really are your key storage. The front is stunning. I've got to say that the theatre of that bonnet, which is also soft clothes, randomly, is really quite something. In here, I'm not so sure. Now, Aston started a very worrying trend with the later models of the run-out Vanquish. They sort of went to the trim department and they, I think they put drugs in the coffee because there's all sorts of patterns and stuff has been appearing in this car. Very, very odd, it must be said, and I'm just not sure it's going to age that well. There's plenty of leather and everything in here, and if you told me that you picked up this car for 150 grand, I would say, excellent, well done, bargain you have got, sir. And for 300, I think the marketing department had some of those drugs as well. That hit is also quite addictive. It really is. I've got to say, it's a lot easier car to place than the Bentley.
With this power figure and the rear wheel drive configuration, it is the Ferrari F12 really that is the car that I've most recently experienced that I should be drawing comparisons with. And they're in fact very, very different cars. The Ferrari is hyper alert, super agile. It's like some sort of turbocharged Terrier without turbos. All right, so it's like a highly strung, naturally aspirated Terrier. I, I, I don't know, it's Clarkson does these things better than I do, I'm afraid. But you get my point. It's always wanted to change direction, regardless of whether that's your plan or not. This, I feel, is a little bit better judged. Now, in fairness, this car is currently running super low tyre pressures, like in the low 20s, because its owner says that's the only way to get even reasonable ride quality out of it. And I can see what he means, because this is in the comfy suspension setting, and it's not perfect. That being said, I think it is better damped than the Bentley, but then it should be, because the Bentley has a lot more weight to contend with. I'm getting to grips with the DBS. That is a process that is happening. I'm, I'm really getting a feel for it. That will probably never get old. I hope my camera's still on the back. Oh, yes. Just a few little pops and burbles and things. Very well judged. Like at 300,000 pounds, I just would simply not bother. I just don't, don't even entertain it. But everybody realized that. And if you are gonna be able to pick one of these up, which I suspect you probably can soon if you can't already, this is the downside of not having been able to research this car, for 150 to 160, would I have one of these over an F12? That is a really, really tricky question. I think if I was just going to go out for a blast, it would be the Ferrari. But if you said to me, hey James, shall we go do the NC500? I'd take the Aston. I really would. the seats commit is not their dubious styling but the fact that they aren't really that supportive they're comfortable enough sure and you can do big distances in the car no trouble but a car with this kind of performance i want seats that really grip me and these simply don't it's really odd actually because old aston seats used to be fantastic i'm not turning that traction control off not at all. You know what? God, this is so close to being brilliant. The steering is decent. It's better than I feared that it was going to be. The old Astons were absolutely magnificent. They really were like running your own fingers over the surface of the road. And, and this one's lost that connection, but it's still got a really nice weighting and it's definitely direct enough. The brakes, however, are troublesome. They are in fact every bit as bad and good as those on the Ferrari. They're certainly effective. They will bring this thing to a halt immediately, but they're very grabby. And that's odd because Aston Martin were one of the first to do carbon ceramics well. The old V12 Vantage that I drove recently had no trouble whatsoever with its brakes. I don't know what went wrong. DBS. DBS. I wish they hadn't called it the Superleggera. That's just a stupid thing to call a car that is many things and Superleggera is not one of them. But I actually, I really do like it. This needs sorting. This, this all is not, not good enough for the money. But the rest of it, yes please. Yes please. I'll have mine in a bright colour though. Ops. Thanks for watching. Thanks very much to Tim for lending me this car. Please like, comment below, subscribe if you haven't already. And I'll see you for the next one. Bye bye.